Welcome to the next installment of my video lecture series for mac macroeconomic principles. And in this one, we're going to take a look at aggregate expenditures and equilibrium output. And in particular, we're going to take a look at the Keynesian consumption function named after John Maynard Keynes, one who came up with this, uh, this idea. This is a Keynesian consumption function. So it says here that consumption is a function of two things, A plus B, Y. A is autonomous spending, i.e. spending that does not uh, relate to or is not a part of income. And you can see here that it is the intercept. There's a positive amount. And the way you could look at this is there's income is equal to zero. Aggregate income is equal to zero. There is still going to be some level of consumption. Individuals can borrow the money from other individuals or individuals can uh, take money out of savings in order to consume when there is no income level. So that's what this consumption function is telling us, that there's two components, an autonomous component of consumption that does not relate to income and a portion that does relate to income. So let's take a look at some constituent parts here that, to have an idea of what we're looking at here. So here we can see here's the change in income. So we're moving from this point here, which relates to roughly, uh, roughly 400 in aggregate income, and it's increasing to 800 in aggregate income. So that's going to tr translate into a change in consumption, because we know that consumption is partially a function of income. So what this tells us is when income changes by an amount, how much we can expect consumption to increase by. So we have an increase in income, this traits translates into a change in consumption. And realize that this is what gives us the slope of the uh, Keynesian consumption line. And the slope is the change in consumption divided by the change in Y. So we have a change in consumption that relates to how much income is changing. So that's the slope of that line. The B parameter here is going to be the slope of the consumption function. So let's take a look at some actual pieces of information here. So we have our Keynesian consumption function here, and it is C equals 100 plus 0.7 Y. We can see here that the intercept of the Keynesian consumption function is equal to 100, that being when aggregate income is equal to zero, aggregate consumption is going to be equal to 100. And if we were, for example, at 400 for aggregate income and we increased our income, we saw an increase in income to 800, the change in income would be equal to 400, so the denominator of the slope is going to be equal to 400. And if we put that 400 in here, we know that that's going to cause a change of 400 times 0.75 or 300. So that gives us the slope of the consumption function, the Keynesian consumption function right here. So this tells us when income is going up, we multiply 0.75 by the change in income, and that will tell us how much consumption changes. Now, if we move further here, we have a specific Keynesian consumption function. All right, and we can see here that we are drawing in a 45-degree line. And this is an important component of this equilibrium analysis, understanding what the 45-degree line represents. This 45-degree line represents all the points where aggregate income and aggregate consumption are equal to one another. So if we are defining that an equilibrium is where aggregate income is equal to aggregate consumption. This 45 degree line here represents all the potential equilibriums that can occur in this macro economy. So all we need to look at is when the consumption function or the consumption line, the Keynesian consumption line, intersects that 45 degree line, that gives us the equilibrium. So in this instance here, the equilibrium is an aggregate income of 400 and aggregate consumption will equal 400. So if we go back to the Keynesian consumption function, if we have 400 multiplied by 0.75, that gives us 300. So 300 plus 100 gives us the 400 for aggregate consumption. All right, now if we take this and let's say that for some reason aggregate income is at 800 and not 
400. So what we're basically doing in this diagram is showing you, number one, that we're not in an equilibrium here, that the equilibrium was at 400, but we're going to take a look at uh, how we can use this information, in particular to look at uh, how we can derive savings from the consumption function. So if we have income equal to 800, if we place that into the Keynesian consumption function, uh, 0.75 times 800 is going to be equal to 600, so 600 plus 100 gives us consumption of 700. Or we can just, if we're graphically doing this, we can go from 800 up to the Keynesian consumption function and over, and that gives us a aggregate consumption of 700. So if you have aggregate, if you have income of 800 and consumption of 700, you're spending 700 of your income, which means that there's a bit left over, which is the savings. So there is positive savings of 100. So to the area of the right, to the right of the equilibrium uh, aggregate expenditures in this, uh, the equilibrium in this macro economy, if you have an income level that's to the right of that, you're going to have positive savings. So all these points from here over, we are going to have income higher than consumption, which means there's going to be some level of savings. Alternately, if we are an area to the left of this, so for example, if we had aggregate income equal to 200, aggregate consumption would be greater than aggregate income. So we would be spending money that we didn't have as income, which means that we were taking it out of savings. We would have negative savings. So one of the things I want you to realize from this is that you can use the Keynesian cross diagram, this is called the Keynesian cross diagram, when you use the 45 degree line along with the Keynesian consumption function, that it helps to, number one, illustrate the equilibrium, but it also shows to, uh, it helps to illustrate that if you have different levels of aggregate income, what that means in terms of savings. So when aggregate income is greater than the equilibrium aggregate income level, you're going to have positive savings, and when you have aggregate income that is less than aggregate consumption, you're going to have negative savings that occurs. So make sure you realize that, that you can derive a savings function by the difference between the 45 degree line and the Keynesian consumption function. In this region up here, when the 45 degree line is greater than the, the Keynesian consumption function, we have positive savings. And when the, 40, when the Keynesian consumption function is greater than the 45 degree line, we are going to have negative savings. Now to take this a step further, we are going to add investment into this. So instead of talking about just consumption in the economy, investment also occurs and that relates to uh, GDP in the economy. So when we move to aggregate expenditures, all we're talking about on, on this level here is that aggregate expenditures is consumption plus investment. So we've just added investment on the consumption to get our aggregate expenditures curve, uh, aggregate expenditures line. So again, we have a equilibrium here where Y is equal to C plus I. So aggregate expenditures is equal to income. So aggregate out output aggregate income is equal to 400 and aggregate expenditures is also equal to 400. But I want to illustrate to you that how in particular if we are not at equilibrium how the market uh, the macro economy should move towards an equilibrium. So let's make the assumption that income aggregate income is equal to 800. So if we do that we can see that when aggregate income is equal to 800, if we go straight up to hit the aggregate expenditures line, we can see that aggregate expenditures are equal to 700. So what occurs here is that income is greater than expenditures. So when firms and they're planning it for their business and what their sales are going to look at look like during the year, they're going to keep inventories to, to make sure that they can meet those sales. And in this scenario here, when aggregate uh, income is greater than uh, aggregate, the equilibrium aggregate output level, what we end up seeing is that inventories start to rise. These businesses have an inventory level that they wish to keep every month, and they see their inventories rising. So, for example, you might have a business, and you want to keep inventories at about a million dollars. 
And then the next month, you have inventories of 1.1 million. And a month after that, you have 1.2. And three months later, you have inventories of 1.3. So your inventories are going above what you want to keep. At some point, these businesses cut back on their orders. They want to get their inventories back to the anticipated level that they want to have. So they're going to cut back on their orders. Now, if you can imagine this happens with multiple companies in the economy, if multiple companies are cutting back on their orders, all the companies that sell to these, uh, these companies that are seeing their inventories go up are going to see their orders fall. So eventually what's going to happen, they're going to cut back on their orders. They're going to lay off individuals. They're going to cut back on their labor force. And what happens is that as these inventories rise, they're going to start cutting back and you're going to see aggregate output and aggregate income shift to the left and move back towards the equilibrium. So what I want you to understand with this is what the equilibrium point is. But on top of that, all right, we make sure you remember that where the aggregate expenditures line intersects the 45 degree line gives us the equilibrium uh, output income and the aggregate expenditures. All right, so make sure you realize that. But on top of that, I want you to realize the other thing that's important here. If we are not at an equilibrium, what forces are in play that will move us back towards the equilibrium? So if we are an aggregate output and income that is in excess of the equilibrium, companies will see their inventories go up in, in an unanticipated fashion, which means they will cut back on their orders, meaning that output will decrease and income will also decrease.